This is a reaction video to Alpha M's video called I Went to Bosley for a Hair Transplant. Gentlemen, welcome to beautiful Beverly Hills. I am so excited for you to be here with me today because we're doing something really cool and super special. We're getting a hair transplant. So many of these folks on uh, YouTube, they go to Turkey. So it's nice to see someone decided to stay in the States. This video has been literally a year in the making and I am so excited to finally make it happen. I guess this was him before his surgery, but it looks like uh, he has a great hairline. So we'll see what they worked on. I always tell people, don't pick the name of the clinic. You're picking an individual surgeon that you need to entrust with your delicate follicles and your appearance for, you know, the rest of your life. That's really how you should approach picking a place for a hair transplant. It shouldn't be based on the country. I mean, ideally it wouldn't be just based on the price either, but I realize for many people that's a real consideration. I respect that. But keep in mind that at the end of the day, there's one surgeon who's ultimately responsible for not just your aesthetic appearance, but also for how you do during the procedure from a safety perspective. We've got something special. It's gonna be an action-packed day. First up, we're gonna meet with Pete, where he's actually gonna allow us to go into the operating room with him to actually see his procedure. Oh, I see. Cause I was like, how much lower can they take this guy's uh, hairline? It already looks so good. So it looks like they're gonna be doing a transplant for someone else. And then this guy is here for, for the ride and to explain to people about the whole process and probably to just market Bosley. Then we're gonna talk to world-renowned hair restoration expert, Dr. Deutsch, about the latest procedures and to answer. So Bosley has many different branches around the country and they have many different doctors in each of these branches. So when you're picking Bosley, you're not picking necessarily a specific doctor unless you go to a specific branch where you know that Dr. So-and-so is at that branch. So all of my questions about hair restoration. And then we're gonna sit down with MMA legend and play Guida to talk about his two procedures to get the ins, the outs, the highs. I do like watching MMA. You know, I'm not like a diehard fan, but I do enjoy uh, seeing it from time to time. And everything you need to know about getting your real hair back. Pete. Aaron. Good to see you, brother. Hey, first off, I just want to say thank you so much for allowing us into your world and your hair loss sort of restoration. It looks like Pete's the patient here. But about when you first started to notice that you were losing your hair and like what it did to you. And he also has an outstanding hairline from what I can tell. So we'll see, maybe he has some thinning further back. Um, I'm curious to know. About 14 years ago when I was 21, um, it was a stressful period and I was starting to notice hairs in my sink, hairs on my... So here he has, uh, at this age, some significant frontal scalp loss, and you can see the recession along the temples as well, and then the whole frontal scalp looks significantly thinned. It was impacting a little bit of my self-confidence. His hair now looks much better, so my guess is that he's maybe on some stabilizing medical therapy, and he probably did have a transplant already, but let's see what he has to say. He started using the finasteride, the topicals, and then what happened? But after about six months, I... On feelconfident.com, we also have finasteride, priced lower than some of the other competition because these are generic medications. So we felt that it was only fair to price them as low as we could so that people don't have to overpay for a generic medication. So head to feelconfident.com, check those out. Hair regrowth, density come back on my crown, my hairline start to come back. Up here where it's receding right up at the front, that's where hair loss started for me. And so the hair follicles have been dying uh, dormant for the most amount of time. And so there's scar tissue that grew over those. And that's why I need a procedure to fill in. It seems like he was just on medical therapy alone. Pretty nice transformation with medical therapy alone, I have to say, more than many patients get. I wonder if he was doing something else in addition to the uh, pills, perhaps uh, microneedling, perhaps laser light therapy or PRP. But if it was just um, finasteride alone, I mean, that's a, that's a nice change with just medical therapy. In terms of the follicles being dormant, that should not result in in scarring. Um, he just mentioned scarring and there's no reason to think that there would be scarring there. There are scarring alopecias, but he certainly doesn't seem to have a pattern to suggest a scarring alopecia. He seems to have a pretty classic male pattern hair loss. And the benefits of medical therapy do plateau over some period of time. So maybe after six months or a year of being on medical therapy, you're not going to continue to see significant gains. You hope for stability and for there not 
to be loss, but you're not going to necessarily see that much more improvement. So I think he's reached that maybe maximal point, and now he's looking for surgery to further enhance the hairline, though in my estimation, the hairline is already in a very natural position and one that shouldn't require surgery, but we'll see. Maybe they come up with a nice design. Absolutely. You're having a hair transplant. About a thousand hairs? Yep. So it's always important to think about whether it's a thousand hairs or is it a thousand grafts. Some clinics will tell you that it's a number of hairs and, and that's fine, but keep in mind that each graft has on average two hairs. So a thousand hairs would be about 500 grafts, which is very different from a thousand grafts, which would be about 2,000 and hairs. That nomenclature is very important to, to figure out with whichever clinic you're talking to and getting information from. My guess is that they still mean a thousand graphs, but we'll see. A little bit nervous, but confident in the doctors. You do not want to trust something that is this present on your face. When you're working at the hairline, for every centimeter that you work on, if you are looking for high density of grafting, that might consume 800 to 1,000 grafts. Every surgeon has a different artistic vision of what a hairline should look like. Every surgeon has a different team that they work with. So it's not necessarily going to be the exact same result, whether you go to Bosley in Texas or Bosley in California or Bosley in New York. That's something to keep in mind. Right now, what's going to happen is Dr. Deutsch is going to come in and basically sit down and draw on Pete to find and identify the perfect hairline. So he's using the skin uh, pencil and he's identified the center of the forehead and he's marked that and then he's marking out more more lateral and connecting the central hairline uh, to the temple essentially and i can see that he's trying to keep a, a natural curvature he's not trying to go completely straight across it's one of those types of cases when a patient comes in and wants this like very subtle refinement in their hairline i'm like okay yeah maybe we can do this that's that's fine but it's not going to be a dramatic change like some people can get when a lot more hair has been lost but for someone who's on medical therapy, understands the potential consequences of doing this type of hairline work where you're you're dropping down, you know, somewhat low there, and they might continue to lose hair in the future, and they might need additional surgeries. You know, I think it's something that, you know, could be reasonable to do. What's the trick to a really great hairline, doctor? First of all, there's certain landmarks that we match up on the patient's face. As you start to lose and recess the hairline in the corners, you want to make sure that it ages appropriately and matches up and looks looks natural. To me, his existing hairline is already very natural looking and is something that I think would look great, you know, in 20, 30, 40 years. This kind of lower hairline is fine, but again, puts him at some degree of risk because if he continues to lose hair, let's say he stops finasteride in a few years and he continues to thin out significantly, they would have already you know, exhausted about a thousand, uh, let's say grafts from his donor area, leaving him with maybe about 5,000 grafts to cover the remainder of the scalp. Now, keep in mind that we all have anywhere from 90 to 100,000 hairs on our scalps. Usually a quarter of that is in that donor area and the rest is in the, you know, traditionally recipient type of zone or DHT sensitive zone. So you don't have enough where you are trying to harvest from or the DHT resistant zones to cover the remainder of the scalp. And that's a very important kind of mathematical point to keep in mind. And we have a video from a while back why you shouldn't lower a hairline in a man and it brings up some of these same points so check out that video if you like i can give you a little valium if you're nervous and you want to, you're okay you, I'll, I'll take the valium okay, we'll give you the valium. okay. <laughs> Or you can put your earbuds in and, and we'll have a good time. Great. Okay. Some patients decide not to take any sedatives at all. So we offer Valium, we offer Ambien, but I do have patients who just decide that they don't need that and they're fine without it. As long as they can stay still for the surgery, uh, then, you know, we can make that work. So here's the deal. He's having a procedure that's called an FUE, which is an advanced treatment for hair restoration. All right. It stands for follicular unit extraction. Right. So this is an FUE technique. So they're harvesting here from the donor area. You can see that the person harvesting is not the doctor. It's, um, you know, someone else from the team. They're using loops and that's fine. But it's something that is worth discussing because, you know, some people want 
only me, the doctor, to do the harvesting. Other people understand that I work with the team and um, I have members of the team who you know, have been harvesting for a very long time. And as long as they have the right uh, licensure and the right background and experience, then I think it's okay to delegate that harvesting role. But it has to be heavily monitored and supervised by the surgeon. And the other thing that I think is worth mentioning is that it's important to make sure that your FUE hair transplant surgeon actually knows how to do FUE harvesting themselves. So if the, some team members you know, aren't there that day or they're not performing properly, you need your surgeon to be able to jump in and do really any part of the surgery. So I think that's a really important question to ask your surgeon. He's having a procedure that's called an FUE, which is an advanced treatment for it's not necessarily that it's advanced. I mean, it is a more modern technique than FUT, though FUT is still um, a very useful type of technique for harvesting. The implantation is going to be very similar between FUE and FUT because FUE or FUT is just describing the harvesting method. And so there are still some disadvantages to FUE compared to FUT, and that includes how many graphs you can extract in any single session and the total yield of grafts over time. So for certain individuals, not for this patient where he overall has good hair, but for patients where they're say a Norwood six, seven, sometimes might consider doing an FUT surgery because you need the yield. They extract the hairs and then over on this side, all right, they're hard at work basically breaking up the hairs into different categories. And the reason this is important is because when they actually go to create Pete's hairline to make it look as natural as possible, the way that they do that is they start the front row with the ones, all right? And then this- He means single hair grafts. And that is true. And oftentimes you don't get enough single hair grafts from the harvest that you need for your hairline. So classically for a hairline that does not involve the temples, which in this patient, they're not going all the way out into the temples because he really doesn't need that. You're looking at anywhere between needing maybe 200 to 250 single hair grafts for about two rows right at the front of the hairline. So for that, you do need to sometimes create your single hair grafts. So you take like a two or a three or a four hair graft and you divide it, which is what one of those women was doing under the microscope. So yeah, and also it's good to work under the microscope to verify that the grafts that are coming out from the back of the scalp are actually all healthy grafts. Because sometimes it can look healthy when you're just kind of like removing it and, and, and uh, pulling it with the forceps. But then when you give it to the person under the microscope, they might see it at a higher level of detail and might decide to discard some of the grafts that were harvested if there's a partial transection or something like that. And then the second row is ones and twos. And then they fill in the threes and the fours behind it to have a natural, soft, sexy hairline. And that's just part of what goes into creating a natural hairline. I have a video on how to fix a receding hairline where I go into incredible detail about the artistry involved in creating a really natural hairline. So make sure to check out that video. I'm really proud of that one. Wayne doing something about it before, you know, <laughs> before it's all gone, I think is, uh, you know, a key. Speed is of the essence. The sooner you catch it, the sooner you do something about it, the happier you're gonna be with the result. Yeah, the key is prevention, really. I always tell patients that hair restoration is not just relying on surgery, but it's also relying on medical therapy. And you want to prevent loss and basically solidify the hair that you have and then build on it with a transplant if needed. How you feeling, Pete? Good. Looking good. I can't believe how like it looks like no big deal in the back. Yes. Anyway, are you ready? I'm ready. You feeling good? So it looks like they're done with the harvest and now they're gonna move on to uh, site making or using implanter pens. We'll see what they end up using. Sometimes it's helpful for this kind of delicate hairline work to actually start with your site making first. Cause this way you have a good sense of how many grafts you really need. Because like they are essentially guessing when they take a thousand grafts from the back of the head. Now, as the doctor starts making, I hope the doctor is gonna be the one making the sites. You're gonna see that sometimes you know, you can only squeeze an 800 into the design that you've made. Other times you realize like, oh, if I only had an extra 100, 200 graphs, it would be very helpful. But it's hard at that point to 
flip the patient over again and harvest more, you can do that, but it's usually better to be more accurate. So a lot of times for these types of cases, I like to start with my site making first and then do the harvest. I feel like I can be more accurate with my numbers that way. Doc, you good? Absolutely, always. I'm gonna make these little incisions now at the proper angle orientation. So now he's using this little blade maker uh, or a needle. It's hard to tell what's exactly on the end of it. He's using it to make the sites. And I also like to make sites. And then my team comes in and places the graphs into the sites that I've made. And the way that the site is made is what sets the angle, the depth, the irregularity, all that is set that way. It's interesting, the ergonomics here, because he's in front of the patient with the patient sitting up at like a 90 degree angle and he's going in that way. I like to be sitting and then I like to have the patient recline back in a chair and then I'm able to better control angles. I find that way uh, versus this method. But again, it just this comes down to, you know, surgeon preference and this method isn't any better or worse than the way I do it is just a different way of accomplishing a similar type of result. I did not realize that it was about the angle also. Yeah. That's important. And then the next few hours, the graphs. The two most important elements are the angle and the direction. But there are these other variables. And I talk about that in the how to fix a hairline video. So right now, guys, they're actually placing the graphs individually into the incisions. Not any pain whatsoever? No. So remember that the pain is controlled with something called lidocaine, which is an anesthetic like what's used by dentists. Something similar is applied to the hairline or let's say in the donor area. And once someone is numb, they stay numb for a long time. Occasionally you need to redose as the day goes on. You go in, an afternoon, you're out, the next day, you're back to basically normal activity. Yeah, I mean, there are some limitations for post-operative care, especially when it comes to like exercise. It's usually best to avoid any strenuous exercise for two weeks. So I wouldn't say you're back to doing absolutely everything you did before surgery on the next day after surgery. But, you know, most clinics, including my own, of course, we have a series of instructions and that helps people in how to get back to their daily life at the proper pace. And we have a video on on our specific post-op recovery instructions. So make sure to check out that video if that might help you. But remember, each clinic is gonna have their own instructions to give you. Your hair starts to grow back in and you're on your way to loving your real hair once again. Remember that the hair falls out first and then the fresh growth starts around three months out and it starts um, at various rates throughout the area where you receive the hair transplant and it's going to improve month after month. I usually tell people at six months, they might see 50 to 60% of the regrowth and then around nine, 10 months might be about 90% of regrowth. It could take up to a year and a half to see your final result. Um, and the people come in after they've had their procedure eight months or 12 months later, they've got more hair. They Keep in mind that when you're looking at post-operative results when it comes to hair transplant surgery and really any cosmetic surgery, Surgery. Notice the angles at which the photos are taken, the lighting conditions. Even though it's difficult to standardize these types of images from before to the after, it's important to try. And so you need to see as you're evaluating a clinic's before and after photos that there is at least an attempt to try to give you honest types of photography that really show you what the results are. They look amazing. They're so happy. There's th that feeling is amazing. It is an amazing feeling. I do agree. People are very delighted um, after, you know, about a year has passed. And some of the common things that I hear is that people no longer need to wear hats um, as often. They feel much more secure in their appearance. And I think that's a huge plus. And yeah, overall, uh, I think the satisfaction rates after hair transplants that are done well is extremely high. So remember the lines we drew this morning yeah. into these areas here? So we got lots and lots of graphs in roughly about, you know, half and half in that area there. So Doc, now I have a question. Okay, so we saw the procedure. What happens next? The beautiful thing about this procedure is it's kind of literally like watching grass grow. I think it's important not to make a hair transplant surgery appear like this non-invasive small procedure that's in and out. These types of surgeries tend to take a long time. They involve a full team. As you saw there, there were at least five people um, as part of the team. And it's hard work to get the results to look right and to deliver great safe care for the patient. So as I wrap up here, I just want to 
impart on everyone that hair transplant surgery is surgery nonetheless. Also, I think it's incredibly important in helping to frame our face and the aesthetic ramifications are huge as well.